Tonight's webinar is by Luxottica. Our speaker tonight is Mr. Jonathan Smith. Mr. Smith is Director of Training at Luxottica Wholesale North America. Jonathan is an MBA graduate who began his career at Luxottica in brand management, overseeing the marketing strategy of several major premium fashion eyewear brands spanning kids and optical categories. With over 12 years of experience in branding and marketing in the luxury, fashion, and beauty industries, Jonathan brings a wealth of business and product knowledge and is known for dynamic and compelling presentations which have impacted thousands of sales and marketing teams to date. Jonathan is an ABO and COPE certified speaker who has created and presented content across the US and Canada and leads the US training department at Luxottica in building a strong education vision and strategy for the company. Welcome, Mr. Smith. Great, good evening and uh, thank you for the introduction and um, <clears throat> glad to see so many on in attendance this evening. Uh, we're gonna take the uh, the next hour and speak about a, a subject very passionate to, uh, to myself uh, and to Luxottica here and that is the art of retailing. Uh, and in our industry today, uh, we are challenged, and, and most in retail are still challenged today, in really meeting uh, the needs of the consumer or the patient in terms of uh, serving them the right product, the right mix, uh, and the right experience uh, that the new consumer is really looking for. And so today we want to spend some time digging into the changing uh, dynamics uh, in the marketplace today, uh, who that new consumer is and what they're looking for, uh, and how we can look at evolving uh, our retail space, our dispensary space, uh, to be more in line with the expectations of this, this new consumer. And uh, we'll share some insights on, on the data as well too, which can help to evolve uh, this space and really transform its opportunity for us uh, in the independent practice uh, today. Uh, I'd like to open up uh, with uh, this slide here, uh, which is really what retail is all about. Uh, and it's really about taking a space, something that's unemotional, geometric in form, devoid of, uh, devoid of anything, any character, and really transforming it to a place. And I think if we were to ask a question here by a show of hands, if we could, of a favorite place that you can recall, I think we'd all have a special memory and a reason why, whether it's a vacation spot or a place in a special city or someone's home. Um, but there's certain characteristics that have taken it from this inanimate, this geometric space to a special place. And, and that's the beauty of retail. Uh, and retail done right helps to transform, helps to move us from that, let's say, unemotional, unimpactful space and becomes memorable, becomes shoppable. Uh, and it takes us from those need zones to these want zones where we desire. Uh, and I'm sure, I'm sure at some place in time, uh, we've all walked into a retail space and walked back out with more than we anticipated on buying, right? Uh, we've had that moment of buyer's remorse. And that's the success of a transitional or successful retail space that helps us to transition, to transact, uh, and convert us uh, and almost allure us uh, in, in, into shopping. And that's the power of a, a particularly strong retail space. I particularly like uh, this, uh, this analogy here uh, given by the CEO of Crate and Barrel. He likened uh, retailing to a theatrical production, and I thought this broke it down quite nicely, and we'll be dissecting uh, some of these elements uh, in greater detail uh, in our own dispensary world of, of optical uh, as we progress through the presentation. But if you think about a, a theatrical production, uh, maybe we have one in mind that's uh, our favorite mine from childhood is Phantom of the Opera, for example. Uh, we think about the components that have to come together uh, in a retail space to make it successful. And he likened it to this theatrical production. And he thought of the store as the stage uh, with scenery, lighting and music, uh, and the products, they're that script. They have a story to be told, nonverbal and also verbal, right? And then the employees really bring it all together. They kind of act it out uh, in that verbal, in that real life production. Uh, but a lot of things go into play there between the lighting, uh, the music, uh, the product, uh, and then the verbal and nonverbal storytelling. And when they come together right, 
then they pr produce something almost like uh, the store produces a production in a way and someone walks in and walks out with a different feeling uh, with an experience uh, and retail wants to give that experience and today's consumer today's patient is looking for a new experience uh, one that's even more theatrical uh, and more even hands-on and interactive and that's the importance of, of retail uh, today so we'll open it right up uh, immediately here in, in terms of a quick poll here uh, and the poll is now open and the question here in regards to the retail optical space is uh, this a retail optical store is best described as all of the following except which so think about what we just talked about briefly in terms of retailing uh, as a theatrical production in the different components of a retail space and think about what would be the, the optimal optical store production needs in terms of the retail space. We'll wait for some of the polls to come in. Great. So I think the polls are all in here. And it, the correct answer is A, the clinic, right? And so um, you've answered, majority of the you've answered it correctly. So having a curated product, uh, very important. Again, the right assortment to the right, to the right fit. Uh, terrific lighting, lighting goes a long way in illuminating that retail product. We'll talk about lighting and its impact on the dispensary today. Uh, and a stage really is that overall setup. Uh, our four or five wall dimensions that we have for our retail space would be that stage for that theatrical production. Great. Okay. All right. Immediately on to a next polling question here, really to set set the set the uh, set the tone for this evening's discussion. And the question here is in one word, in one word, what is the retail experience about? Uh, is it about online? Is it about complexity? Is it about the consumer? Or is it about the millennials? So what is the retail experience really ultimately about? What should we be thinking about when gearing all of those aspects of that stage performance? All right, awesome. So it looks like the poll is still open. Okay, great. So it looks like the poll is closed. All right, and the majority you've got you right. You've got it right here. That's a C, the consumer. And so building a consumer-centric retail space is the key. Right, and uh, as we go about this, think about again putting them before us. Even when at choosing, when choosing the product, when choosing the space, uh, we may have a certain opinion about things that we like. But again, we want to look to the needs of the consumer, consumer centric, uh, for success and being able to retail uh, in that space. So great, good. So let's move on to talk about some of the uh, current uh, changes that are in the marketplace. I'm sure many of you have been in the uh, in this space, in this industry for five, 10 years. I've spoken to many audiences where I see 40 and even 50 uh, years in the industry. And we've seen a lot of change, haven't we, in the last, let's say, five and 10 years. And what we can expect is that this, this, this uh, pace of change will continue to happen uh, in the next five or 10 years and accelerate uh, as these retail spaces continue to change, but also dynamics in our own industry will change. And so we pointed out six different elements here of change. We'll focus on a few here uh, this evening. Uh, consumer shift being one, uh, there's a new consumer. Uh, there's a new generation, so there's a generational change as well. Uh, layer on top of that, we all have been faced in every industry with the challenges or com competitive nature of the online marketplace, right? Uh, healthcare reform, uh, profit pressure from inconsistent patient traffic, has been tough as well as the online competition, which is added to the profit pressure. And then in certain regions, we are seeing a tremendous, tremendous amount of market consolidation uh, where independent practices are being bought up or merging uh, with these uh, larger, uh, larger chains that uh, understand retail very, very well and are able to take that dispensary and really turn it into something that turns five and six times a year. And so we're seeing a lot of market consolidation in the industry as well too. So those are some of the current pressures or changes uh, in the marketplace today. But I'm really focusing on two that uh, I'm passionate about and, and really also are keen to this discussion in meeting the needs. And the first one uh, is the new shopper, is the new consumer. And that's really all of us uh, here today, whether we are young or old, 
uh, we've all become a little bit different in our shopping behavior. And that's due to the digital revolution that's taken place in the last 20 years. Uh, I'm sure if we were all in front of each other right now, I'm sure we all have a smartphone sitting right next to us. I'm sure some of us are even kind of peering over at it right now. Uh, and we've gone from not only just being digital uh, to becoming mobile digital. Uh, and that's, that's changed the way that we interact, not only with friends, family, and others in the way that we communicate, but it's greatly, greatly transformed the way that we interact with the retail brick and mortar space. Uh, think about 20, 30 years ago, how we would interact with a, let's say a car salesman. We may show up, uh, we may hassle in person at, at a car dealership. Uh, he has all the control there on uh, the price point, uh, on the uh, blue book value, on all the features and benefits. And we have nowhere really to run quickly to kind of do some comparison shopping. And so we say that's a buyer, that's a seller's market where they're in control. And today we've shifted, right? Uh, we've shifted to a, a buyer's market. Uh, it's a place today where we are more con more control than, than that seller. We have more information. We have more choices than ever before. Uh, and we go in, we go in educated. We go in informed. Think about uh, even when we go to visit a doctor, for example. I'm sure many of us have attempted to look at our symptoms ahead of time. Uh, probably freaking ourselves out, but we certainly go in and we challenge the institutions because we're more connected and we have the ability to uh, to do this, um, to be informed. Uh, and buying a car is no longer a complicated process. Uh, we don't need to see a real human to do it. We don't need to go from lot to lot uh, and hassle. We can buy a car in under five minutes on our phone, choose all the colors. We know not only all the features and benefits, we can comparison shop, we can get the best deal. Uh, and uh, and we have, even know the resale value of that car as well too. And so we again are an empowered uh, consumer, and that affects us all, uh, both uh, in what we do in the retail space. And the second major change uh, is a new generation that's come about, uh, and that generation is uh, a generation that we need to start targeting because that generation uh, will soon be the largest generation, not only by population, uh, but will also be by uh, dollar contribution, we'll talk about that uh, briefly here. And so this screen here with these five generations, I find very impactful because as we're living longer, these five generations from the silent generation all the way down to the Gen Z generation there, uh, or the next generation as we've targeted here on the slide, are walking through our dispensary today. And so we have a lot of different characteristics, uh, a lot of different personalities a lot of different expectations and needs that are, are walking through our dispensary. Now, the silent generation, we understand them. Uh, they love us. Uh, they're easier to deal with, uh, generally speaking, when it comes to a brick and mortar interaction. Uh, and then the baby boomers, again, the largest population uh, boom to hit uh, the globe. And one that our retail space, our marketing efforts have been zeroed in on, have been perfected for the last 30 and 40 years. In fact, Really, everything we've done under the sun, from marketing to advertising to branding, uh, even think of brands like Ralph Lauren and others, have been built have been built around the baby boomer generation. Uh, but they are starting to retire, uh, and as they're starting to retire, their spend is starting to go into other categories uh, and uh, into other places and focuses. And there's a new generation now, the millennial generation, uh, born 1980 and onward, uh, that is. Uh, now becoming the new CEOs uh, that is now graduating college or or graduate school uh, or now starting their own companies and being a very successful entrepreneurs and so this generation is the one we want to focus in on because not only are that they are at, at that stage now in their life but they're also projected to be larger both in not only dollar but also in population size in fact uh, by 2020 so we're only about a year and a half off now they will now supersede the dollar spend by the baby boomer generation. So this is historic. Uh, the Gen X generation was small. It didn't contribute to this large piece of the pie. But in North America alone, uh, breaking down uh, Canada and the U.S., it's about a 900 billion uh, in the U.S., and it'll be about 500 million uh, by 2020. Uh, in, in Canada, to give you some perspective on that $1.4 trillion, $4 trillion number, will be larger than the baby boomers. And right now, they represent about a trillion dollars today uh, in the North American marketplace. So they're just shy of their ultimate forecasting goal here. 
the baby boomer generation is about 1.1, 1.1 and a half trillion dollar spend. So they'll certainly supersede uh, and the size of the prize certainly is, is much bigger. And so we need to understand this generation to make sure that our retail experience really goes after this new generation and understanding them is certainly critical. So I'll pause here for a moment uh, just to uh, make sure that you're still with me, especially that millennial generation, uh, if you're on and know we're all attention uh, starved a little bit. So the question here in this open poll is, what's the spending power of the millennial generation today? Today is key. So what's that spending power in North America uh, today? So is it $1 million, $1 billion, uh, $1 trillion, or is it $2 trillion? And again, think about it in today's terms here in 2018, as they start to progress towards surpassing that baby boomer generation. Again, a historic moment if they do it in, in 2020. All right, so I believe the, uh, the polling is closed here. Uh, and the correct answer, as the majority of you guys have uh, stated here, is $1 trillion. So that's what that represents today in terms of spending power just right behind right behind the baby boomer generation. Uh, so again, we need to think about capturing these dollars because uh, these are the dollars uh, of the future. Now, the millennial generation comes with some unique characteristics. Uh, maybe uh, you are some here in the audience today, maybe some are, uh, are parents of millennials uh, and can attest to this. Uh, I'd like to share a quick video here, which I think gives you some perspective on the nature and characteristics of the baby, sorry, of the millennial generation. And so I'm just going to quickly pull up this video here. So we'll watch this for about the next two minutes and then discuss this uh, together. see that video there. I think the import of the message there, if you've noticed some of the characteristics, I'm sure some of you are nodding your head there of uh, an experience either with a millennial as a consumer patient base or 
uh, maybe uh, <clears throat> you're used to your family meal being completely uh, with everybody on their phones. Uh, the millennial generation is unique in a couple of different ways that I want to hone in on here. Uh, you probably saw that one, uh, they're very digitally savvy. They grew into the digital era. Uh, so some were born, let's say, in analog and, and moved into the digital experience. That's probably the majority of them, but they're very digitally savvy. Uh, using about two to three devices on average per day. The second part is convenience factor. Uh, and I think that's one we want to consider when it comes to our retail space. They want it now. Uh, they want to have it immediately. And so they're willing to pay extra, triple, and quadruple the amount, right, uh, for overnight shipping just to get the product. So that instant gratification is, is a key part of the characteristic of that millennial generation. And the third part, uh, which we'll hone in on, is they want a knowledgeable associate because at the end of the day, they're good at self-selecting. Uh, they're okay with the online experience. So why come to the brick and mortar and why have somebody that knows nothing about the product representing it, right? There's no value add to it. And so they can do it on their own. They don't need you. And so they want to make sure there's a seamless and a, and, and, and a beautiful transaction that happens uh, in the real world. And so that's why we see 68 to 70% of millennials want an integrated seamless experience. If it's online, and they move to the brick and mortar, they want to feel as if it's in one store, it's an omni-channel experience, uh, and the feeling is exactly the same. And that's, uh, that's very, very important for that consumer, that patient base to stay in your practice today. The second big part about the millennials all but really involves all of us today, as I say, we've become millennial-esque, is that our attention spans have also gone down, uh, and this can impact our retail space as well, too. So in 2000, before the digital revolution, we had a attention span of about 12 seconds. And we've gone down about eight seconds. It's one second shy of a goldfish. So a little embarrassing. Um, but again, what is this telling us? It's telling us that those that are coming through our door uh, are attention starved. They have a bit of FOMO, right? And they want to be somewhere else. And they're very engaged with what's happening on their phones. And so we have to keep them engaged, especially think about also our branding uh, and the nature of that. So the polling question here is, all of the following are changes affecting today's optical except uh, generational change, uh, healthcare reform, increased market segmentation, uh, or online. So think about that slide that had the six different market changes. Think about the different uh, industry pressures uh, that, are, that we're facing today, which one uh, is not a current industry um, Pressure. Okay. All right. So the one that wouldn't affect us here is C. It's the increased market segmentation, uh, but online healthcare reform and generational change were all key elements of change and pressure in the industry today, especially the generational change with the millennial, the online competition, and even healthcare reform in different aspects uh, continues to add pressure to to profit. Uh, margins as well too. Great. Right, let's get into the retail landscape uh, here. Um, the retail landscape certainly has changed. We think about uh, an Apple store. Maybe 15 years ago, we wouldn't have think we wouldn't have thought about uh, standing in line for an hour and a half to get into an Apple store to pay for a two three thousand dollar computer. Uh, but now, really, where do we go? Why do we go to an Apple store? It's really for that experience. Uh, it's there to play with the products, uh, less about just the transactional moment. Uh, and just the other day, for example, I went for a DJ class in the Apple Store here in Soho. Uh, friends of mine go to there just to do some painting uh, to classes as well, too. And so there's a different experiential uh, element. This that means we want to transform what we call the bulldozer or the past of, let's say, our retail experience that we've been providing uh, to our patient base or consumer base where it is unbranded. Uh, where it's cluttered, uh, where it's locked. Um, we want to transition that to a space that looks cleaner and is more along the mindsets of experiencing the products. Uh, for example, like a space like this. And for those that recognize this space, this is a Warby Parker. This is the original store down in Soho, New York. Uh, I don't live too far from this. There's still a line around the corner. It's been there for at least six or seven years, uh, if not more now. Uh, and what they've done here is created an environment with product that's $99 at, at once it was $99 uh, and less with a full complete pair, but gives you an ambiance, a feeling uh, that they have product that's much more expensive. Uh, it's organized neatly. Uh, there is uh, kind of a, an overall cleanliness to the store, collegiate nature. Again, a lot to do in the transformative nature 
of the retail space and the impact, emotional impact that it gives us uh, when it comes to, to buying. Now, yes, we talked about the millennial, we talked about online pressure. Uh, the good news is that the store environment still remains a great opportunity, one of the best opportunities really to inspire consumers to spend. You can see this even with the Warby Parker example, uh, where they went from starting in an online world but transitioning to a brick and mortar. And now they have over 66 different locations in North America and are continually looking to expand to 100 plus because they understand, uh, especially in this industry actually with optical and sun, uh, about 90% of all consumers recently polled uh, in Forbes magazine said that they prefer to shop in store for, for optical and for sun because it's a harder and more technical fit. And so it's one of the unique categories that is more protected against the online world. And the dispensary is still a strong place for them to play with product and to create the right environment. And overall, the millennials, although it's, a, it's kind of, yes, they like to shop online, it's a myth that they do the majority of the shopping online. It's, that's actually that 82% still prefer the brick and mortar. Uh, that's overall the industries. In our industry, it's about 89 to 90%, so a little bit higher. Uh, and so they want to see, they want to feel the product, and that's, uh, that's the good news. The bad news, however, is that when it comes to this industry, especially in the independent practice, uh, a lot of the consumers, the millennials, are telling us, hey, we come in, we're having a difficult time finding what we need, uh, and 20 to 25% actually say, hey, thank you, doc. And they get my prescription and they take one step out the door. And what they're saying here is, I don't see enough product selection. I don't see uh, an experience that really allures me, that desires uh, my money that I want to spend here. And that's the experience we're talking about when it comes to this part of the retailing experience. Okay. And then a lot of shoppers are saying, hey, retailers, listen, I've seen the Apple Store, I've seen Mac Store. I've seen the transformation they've made, they've given me an experience. Uh, they agree that most retailers could do more to enhance that experience, whether it's a digital opportunity, whether it's a customizing opportunity, whether it's better lighting, better selection, uh, better branding. All of those things, shoppers are saying, hey, it's time to step up. I'm experiencing great retail. Uh, I want to have that as a universal thing in, across many different industries. Okay, so that's important for us to understand because the consumers are saying something, they're saying, hey, uh, it's time to change, it's time to evolve. Uh, we expect something different. So we'll open up uh, this to the audience here. Uh, and the question here is ex exactly what we we're just discussing. And what percentage of shoppers believe that optical retailers could do more? So what percentage of consumers are saying, hey, we experience great stuff in a lot of different industries. We think retail is still slow to evolve. Uh, how many feel, especially the millennial generation, that retailers uh, could do more? Still collecting a few responses here, but I'm seeing an overwhelming, overwhelming response here. Great. Uh, so the correct answer, which the majority of you uh, did provide here, is A, uh, 70%. It was a fresh stat in your mind, so that's great. And again, all opportunity here for us in moving forward, especially uh, in this uh, industry. Okay. Now, the dispensary uh, still provides one of the best opportunities for us to connect with the consumer, but it also provides one of the best opportunities for our top line revenue contribution. And I just want to share this with you to give you a sense of the breakdown, the breakdown of the, uh, of the dispensary. Now successful dispensaries, you can see here, below the eye exams and the medical eye care are important aspects. Successful ones with their dispensary can produce at least 44 to 60% of their top line revenue from prescription eyewear uh, and contact lenses alone. And so this is a powerful statement here showing the contribution uh, that can happen from retail if done correctly. Uh, and I came from the L'Oreal world. I was there for about three or four years with the independent salon practice, uh, speaking to about 110,000 different salons. Uh, and the same reigned true there. Retail, when they got it right, uh, paid for the space more so than the haircut itself. And so if they can get the retail right, uh, they had a much higher successful rate. In fact, nine out of 10 salons close. Uh, on an annual basis, the higher rate of failure in any business, independent practice in, in the United States and in, in Canada as well too, uh, because a lot wouldn't focus on the retail area. But it is, a, it is an opportunity for us across uh, many industries, including this one. Now patients are coming in, uh, they see the doc as an important part, but one in three or a third are walking back out due to poor merchandising. And this represents about a $3.5 billion opportunity 
uh, that's going elsewhere because people have to fulfill those prescriptions, right? Or if they're getting contact lens fittings, they're buying sun from somebody else. Uh, and we see that the independent eye care practitioner is still conducting the majority of all eye exams, uh, but only selling a fraction or less than half of all the frames in the industry. And so there's that disconnect. There's an opportunity to, again, capture a higher rate of that patient base walking in the door, they're coming to you for all things eyes, but somehow when they get to the dispensary, they're making a, a no and taking a prescription and going elsewhere. And so this is a, an opportunity uh, for the industry as a whole, uh, for us as the independent eye care uh, practice. And so we'll open it up here to another a quick polling question. Uh, and this question here is, what is the total missed dollar opportunity for the gap between eye exams conducted by the independent optometry practice and frames sold. So what is that dollar that's missed in North America uh, for the ECP because they are walking out of the door, uh, because they are not being captured at the dispensary, not buying a frame or sunglass uh, from the practice. So think about uh, what dollar opportunity could, uh, could be incremental uh, revenue to the practices here in North America. All right, so the polling question is enclosed. Okay, and we have uh, a couple different answers here. The majority of you chose C, uh, which is correct. Okay, so it's an opportunity of $3.5 billion that are being spent elsewhere outside of the independent practice right now uh, because the capture rate is only getting about two-thirds and one-third of walking out the door. So a huge opportunity here. Uh, and again, it comes down to that retail space that we'll talk about uh, in a second. Okay. So let's dive right into uh, five key areas that we want to focus on when it comes to the retailing space. And we'll use words like uh, moving from the waiting room to the living room or the reception to the concierge. And really what we're trying to do is move people from that need zone uh, to that want zone. And so we'll focus on five different characteristics starting from store design to digital that can really bring uh, this, this home in our, our optical space and our dispensary space. So let's start here with uh, the store design, and we'll keep uh, each one of these fairly succinct and brief uh, and open up to questions at the end here so we have time to dialogue. Uh, the first part about it is we have this space we want to transition to a place. We want to create an, an environment that uh, is functional, it holds the frames, provides the great lighting, uh, but also has our own flavor, it's original. But the key is uh, that we want to create a multi-sensory environment that's experiential. And we can be almost our best judges of that. So if we could walk through our front door and we personally would shop it and are excited about it, it's a good first step in the right direction. Okay, and sometimes we have to test that ourselves to see if we'd even be ones that shop it. The second question to ask is after we say we would shop it, does it transform me from the zone of I need to see the eye doctor, I need to see well, to I want to buy frames and I want to pay more to express myself and look better? Uh, because no one just comes in to see better. They want to see better and not look worse. They still want to see better, look better, and maybe even express oneself. So does it move the needle? Does it take them out of that doctor zone into a retail space where they want to shop? So those are some just quick key thoughts in terms of judging the space um, by standing back at a macro level. The second part is the balance in the storytelling. So think, are we going to be a uber luxury door? Are we going to be a luxury are we going to be a spread between premium fashion, fashion and luxury? Uh, because we know our demographic is a mixed in its variety. Uh, the key is to make a statement and to make sure that that statement is captured. And if we're all things to all people, if we carry way too many brands, uh, we will dilute the space. It'll be an absolute failure. We won't make any type of statement. In fact, the independent ECP on average in, in, in North America carries about 47 brands. I can tell you that's way too many brands and I'm sure you're nodding your head correctly as well too. But a lot of times, maybe we bring in five or six frames because someone asked for it and we wanna capture this, we wanna capture that. But if we dispense that, if we merchandise that, we dilute the branding appeal uh, and we don't have the strength in numbers and that can be a huge mistake uh, for an opportunity. Now, if it comes to a, a uh, standard practice that's doing uh, let's say premium uh, brands, fashion and lifestyle brands, we would recommend no more than 20 brands. No more than 20 brands. And if you're an Uber luxury or a luxury door, we would say 16 or less brands, 16 or less brands would be appropriate.
appropriate for that store because again, the branding is so important, it's so powerful. Let the brand breathe and you'll sell more with less. Selling more with less is, is key in making a statement here. Okay. So less than 15, less than 16, that's where you want to go. So we'll open this up here for a poll question here uh, to, uh, to give a pause for reflection. And the question is an ultra luxury optical boutique, one that's really focusing on luxury and ultra luxury. How many brands should they carry? How many brands should they carry? Should it be more than 22? Uh, fewer than 15, between 16 and 22 brands, between 20 and 26 and go seasonal. Give that one some thought in terms of how you'd want to position luxury or uber luxury type brands uh, in your dispensary. Again, to give that proper focus uh, on uh, the branding experience. Great, so the, uh, the question uh, is closed now uh, and the answer is B and the majority of you got that correct. And so it's less than 15 brands. Again, we want to cap out at 20 brands as a general recommendation. But the more you have these luxury brands, uh, we would say at least 15 or less uh, would be really a perfect formula for uh, retailing uh, those special brands that have such strong identities uh, and such strong storytelling. Great. Good job. Okay. Continuing down uh, the retail space, uh, a third area for consideration, simply put, is to manage and maintain. Uh, we've, I've walked by some stores in uh, New York City on my way to work, and it looks sometimes as if uh, these stores, whether they're shoe stores or optical stores, are collectors of cardboard merchandising. Right? You see it yellowing in the door with UV radiation, maybe has the Vogue image from three years ago. Uh, and that millennial consumer is going to walk in and walk out. Uh, it's kind of just repulsive in a way uh, and distasteful. And so, be mindful when it comes to the collateral, the merchandising we're using. Uh, keep it clean, keep it neat. Obviously, dusting anything uh, in stores. I still go into uh, high-end uh, stores and see dust on merchandise sometimes, and that's obviously a, a big miss. And so simply put. But here's another trick, too, to keep the store fresh, sometimes just rotating the product, maybe even going counterclockwise by an hour, can really be a nice trick to kind of uh, freshen up uh, the store practice, not even changing up the brands. I was in Zara the other day, I bought a pair of pants, went back to buy the same pair of pants the week after, and they shifted the whole store about an hour clockwise just to give you a new perspective. And I felt like it was a brand new assortment because I was experiencing the store in a different order. So a really cool merchandising trick, trick that a lot of, uh, lot of retail is using uh, today just to give a new uh, experience. Now let's talk about that experience and let's talk about uh, what it means when it comes to the zones in the consumer journey, because this is important. And as the consumer goes through the store, he certainly is on a journey, hopefully a journey to purchase. Uh, and there's different areas that we want to attract, we want to help coerce or help him to uh, desire to decide, to discover and then celebrate with that purchase. Uh, and so each of those touch points are important. We'll talk about uh, some of those after a short video. But think about this trick. Uh, Macy's did a huge study and found that Consumers typically shop by walking in and starting by going to their right and then going counterclockwise. And so if we think about that, where would we put our most expensive or most desirable product? Would it be far in the back or maybe would we actually pull it forward? Because 80% of the time in this industry, people end up going back to choosing the first product they touched. And that's just part of human nature. We have we try and zero in and, and kind of narrow down very, very, very quickly because we can't be consumed by clutter. And so we try and narrow things very quickly. I'm gonna play a short video here, which is I think an awesome concept store uh, opportunity. And this will give some general uh, guidelines of things we wanna talk about when it comes, to, uh, it comes to merchandising in the store. So let's play this and then we'll, we'll discuss this.
let's talk about some of those uh, key areas uh, of the dispensary. Hopefully you noticed uh, some things uh, there that were unique about the space, like a uh, concierge area uh, and the way that the product was also, um, let's say, merchandised from highest product back to lowest product, uh, the key areas of lighting, uh, and even the, oct the eye exam being all the way in the back, uh, something that Warby Parker does as well, too, as the retailer is the, the foremost part of it, and people want to play with the product, and that's kind of the the thought process there, a lot of uh, that concept of, of the dispensary. Uh, for many of you that do window displays, uh, one thing to keep in mind uh, is that uh, they have stopping power uh, if they're done right. And the message should be simple uh, and should be clean and impactful uh, and be able to be something that someone can get within a fraction of a second, right? And so these are some examples of uh, windows done at Bloomingdale's 59th Street. Uh, and Louis Vuitton here with sunglasses uh, have stopping power and one clean message. But a trick to uh, window displays in general, if you're using them, uh, is if you're trying to promote a product and you want somebody to buy that product, it's good to repeat that product as soon as someone takes one step in the door because oftentimes they'll try and search for that product with a thousand frames in the board space uh, and they won't be able to find it. So a good trick is to obviously have stopping power with maybe a pedestal right there as they walk through the store. All right, uh, the second key area is uh, curated assortment. You can find that right mix uh, as the product, as the retail space has value. We wanna make sure that we have the right brands in place uh, that have uh, that pay their real estate, uh, right? And so they have to turn uh, and that's, that's key. So in terms of deciding, one is getting to know your consumers that are walking through the door, understanding the demographics of who they are. And um, we can do this by looking at some simple tools through Google, uh, through, through uh, census data, those types of things can go a long way to understand whether our price mix, our brand mix, uh, is appropriate to the marketplace. But even more key than that is to make sure that we have a system in place to track uh, and measure the success of our trends. Uh, for example, do we know our capture rate? Uh, do we know our average retail selling price point? Uh, do we know the expected turn of our frame by brand on the board space? And is it meeting the national average of 2.5 on an annual basis, for example? And so understanding these types of things will help us to refine our selection uh, and understand whether we have a dead brand sitting there that feels like it's turning, uh, but is really actually just taking up uh, real estate dollars, uh, capital dollars that we can reinvest in better brands and maybe augment other brands as hero brands, right? And so we need to build in a proper, proper uh, tracking mechanism there. And if you wanna play in Sun, which we strongly recommend from a merchandising, from an assortment planning standpoint, uh, which can be super successful to dispensaries that get it right, uh, you have to build in critical mass. And so we recommend at least 25 to 30% of your board space has to be sun only, plan O to prescription opportunity versus the optical. You won't lose out on the optical sales. You only have incremental cash dollars usually coming from the sun. And so a real nice opportunity, but make sure that we have that proper split in the dispensary uh, when it comes to building a sun opportunity. So we'll open that up for a quick question here uh, to make sure you're still with me. Uh, and that is the question is around building that sun opportunity in your practice today. And so to be effective uh, for sunglasses in the optical balance here, how much sun should we carry? Should it be A, between 25 and 30? B, only show sunglasses by brands, less than 100 units, uh, or one sports brand and one fashion brand? And how can we be successful uh, when it comes to sun? Great, so it's very fresh in mind. You guys all got it right here. For the majority, uh, 25 to 30% of your overall board space should be sun. Uh, and this will give the critical mass that the millennial that the consumer is looking for uh, when it comes to uh, shopping and that experience. Again, keep sun in mind as that incremental opportunity, especially a cash only opportunity uh, outside, of the, uh, outside of insurance. Okay. Just checking on time here. I want to try and conclude in the next uh, two or three minutes. I want to make sure we have time for questions. So I'm going to uh, to move through these next two points fairly quickly, but we'll certainly circle back with them on some Q&A if needed. Uh, the third important part of uh, retailing is storytelling. There's both nonverbal and verbal. Your nonverbal is your merchandising uh, and how you display and how you attract. But outside of that, your verbal is your employees. Again, they're those actors in the store. And so bringing them to life is super important. 
Uh, I never saw an industry where medical meets fashion uh, and the opportunity of so many fashion houses, luxury brands jumping in with immense stories, with heritage and history. Uh, and if we stand there silent, if we don't pass that on, we're not bringing an emotional connection to an inanimate object. And we're missing out on that final connection. And that's the consumer patient that will probably tell you, hey, can I just get what my insurance covers and takes a step out the door, right? We haven't converted them. We haven't seduce them uh, into the beauty of the product. And so learn the stories of the brands from Ray-Ban to Maui to Prada, uh, and then talk about the features and benefits and bring it to life. And people will start to want to repeat those stories and it goes a long way. And a really important part here is the visual merchandising and the organization of the store to bring that brand to life in that nonverbal way is to organize your collections by brands. Uh, some may choose to do, do by gender, uh, but we would strongly recommend that you merchandise by brands. Take, for example, this Oliver Peoples here display. We have women's on the left, we have men's on the right, we have unisex in the center. We're identifying this through the visuals, okay, so that can generally guide the public into where they want to go. And I can tell you it's only the men. It's 80% of the men are freaked out about buying a women's frame, and that's the only part that we end up over merchandising for and separating out. But what we do is we dilute the brand story and we make it a longer journey for that patient base to kind of see the brand on both sides if they're, if they're wanting to experience. And so we strongly recommend keeping the brands together in the visual merchandising uh, here and then divide it up by imagery, by digital, uh, and creating that space here will be much more impactful. And so we'll open up our, one of our last polling questions here uh, to the audience on displaying and discussing about frames and brands. And uh, the question here is, uh, what is a good way to display and discuss uh, brands in the retail space? Should it be by gender and color, to use storytelling techniques, adding a discount, or using social media? Okay, collecting a few more responses. All right, good. So again, uh, the majority of you answered correctly here uh, and that the answer is B, to use storytelling techniques. So a little bit of a trick question there because I didn't talk about merchandising it by brand, but by using storytelling techniques, we are merchandising it by brand because we're telling the true story of the brand. Okay? And that will come to life. And especially the millennial, they're loyal to brands, they know brands very, very well, and they want that full brand impact. And so merchandising by brands, again, Looking at an image here where there's an attempt at some branding, uh, but I think the feeling is unanimous here of a bit claustrophobia, uh, dim lighting, right? It looks more like a storage closet than anything else. And again, this is not proper visual merchandising. This would lead to somebody saying, hey, let me get my prescription uh, and walking out. Okay, last point, last two points here is um, a knowledgeable staff. At the outset, we talked about the millennial looking for knowledgeable staff. And 91% of people, especially in the eyewear industry, are looking for that perfect fit, okay, that frame advisement, because it's a very technical fit. And so empowering your staff with tools to be educated, to be knowledgeable, not only on frame fit, but also on brand, is going to really, really set you apart uh, from the experience they'll get in the self-selection zone. And again, that's online. They can do that. Uh, and so what is that value proposition uh, we bring to the dispensary? And then lastly, it would be we'd be a, a remiss without mentioning digital uh, as a huge component. We could spend another hour and a half really talking about how we could augment our dispensary with digital. Uh, but don't overcomplicate it. Uh, starting simple can go a long way. Uh, but this new generation wants to play and they want to see digital. And we all probably want that experience now. And so starting simple with brand videos and iPad. Uh, that even has interactive tools. Many manufacturers offer free apps which allow you to see all the different technical aspects in a fun, fun way of how a frame polarizes or how a frame changes color and transitions. Things of that nature can really be fun to play. Uh, it could even be a selfie wall. Uh, many practices are getting involved in this where you just take a few pictures, you can send it to yourself. What does that do? It reminds somebody of the experience they had, whether they purchased or not. They came to Dr. Smith's practice and they took a picture of a fun frame and went home with that as a gift for free. They didn't even buy, but they remember a fun experience. And that goes a long way to building building a reaction and building an emotional connection. Intermediate, we can go into this 
extending our aisle, extending how much product we offer with our maybe our online experience, merging with our physical. And then if you've ever seen at some of the expos, RFID technology is coming into play where you just drop the frame on uh, a table and it brings up videos and all the storytelling. It's fantastic, incredible technology. But it's just augmenting the customer experience. So just keep in mind some simple to complex ways that we could start to enhance the experience. So people play, there's a stickiness factor and there's a reason to be, to want to be in the store more than just the product itself. Uh, and that'll really help uh, go a long way in terms of, uh, again, increasing that capture rate and nailing down the art of retailing experience. Uh, again. Let's open up to our last question here and then we'll open up for a few minutes for questions. Uh, and the question here is, all of the following are touch points of the ideal consumer experience except which one? So all of the following are touch points of providing the ideal consumer experience uh, except which one it is prescription, store design, curated design, or knowledgeable staff. So which one is not part for a few additional answers here. Which one is not part of successful retail dispensary? And it's now closed. Okay, the majority of you answered correctly and that is prescription. Uh, and that is not part of the elements that we talked about. So we talked about the importance of store design, the impact, a curated design, one that's unique but speaks to who you are and the frames that you offer, right? If it's luxury, make sure it's a luxury environment. And then that knowledgeable staff that really brings it home as the actor is telling that story. Great, fantastic. Good. All right. So uh, that concludes uh, the art of retelling. I think there was a lot to digest there. I uh, tried to move fast here at the end to make sure that we have a few minutes for questions. If you do have some additional questions, however, uh, please feel free to contact me anytime here at the email address uh, on the screen. I know the lecture also is being recorded, and so we'll share that again afterward. But it's been a pleasure here this evening, and I'd like to turn this over now uh, to Cheryl and the crew uh, for, for some additional dialogue and also some q &A. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. So we have a few questions here, um, but if any of you have other questions, please um, type them in. So the first question, Jonathan, is why do you not recommend merchandising by gender? Yeah, merchandising by gender, uh, if you have a powerful brand, uh, fashion brand, Prada, Chanel, others, uh, you really want to make sure the story is not split in two. Uh, and so when you create a strong storytelling experience, you keep it in one location. Uh, and this has proven time and time again to be much more effective to the consumer mind who walks in, can spot the brand, and takes themselves right to that journey. It's a shorter journey. They have to go to one space. Uh, and the impact the allure, the desire that it creates is much more impactful than splitting it in two. Uh, we found that to be effective across really all industries. Great, thank you. We have another question. How much real estate do you recommend per brand? Great, so we talked earlier about um, 20 brands max, and so we'll use that as an illustration. Uh, and then if you want to go on the SKU basis, we would say 5% of your SKUs per brand, uh, and that gives you 5% times 20 brands or 100% of your store. Uh, so 5%, use that as kind of uh, a way to kind of measure out the, the skew count. So if you have a thousand frames on the board space, you can do it by, uh, by percentage there. If you do have hero brands, we would say notch that up to 10%. Uh, if it's a big lifestyle brand and then dial down or dial down some of the other brands to 18 or 16 brands and dial up the percentage on those hero brands. 5% is at minimum 10 to 15% should be the board space for your top end brands. Great, thank you. We have one question here. If I dedicate 25 to 30% of my board space to Sun, won't I lose out on optical sales? Yeah, that's a common, that's a common, uh, common fear. Uh, remember, however, that the consumer or patient base only needs a certain amount of brands to choose from, and they just need to be the right brands. And so uh, you'll find often that uh, you'll probably end up cannibalizing yourself with so many brands in the store anyhow. We have yet to see a practice that's invested in 20 to 30 percent sun and has not seen incremental dollars with a small to nil uh, negative impact on the optical side of the business. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, those are all the questions we've received. So I'd like at this time to thank um, Mr. Jonathan Smith for his insightful presentation. And I'd like to thank Luxotica for partnering with OAO for tonight.